Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to our Bible study tonight. I'm just going to get on and see if I can share this real quick. I had some challenges last week, but let me see if I can uh, can do it this this time. Let's see. Um, all right, here I am, and I'm sharing it on my feed. Nice and easy, right? <laughs> Share it again to our group page, and, um, and I got to find it. I got too many pages that I'm uh, groups that I'm following here on Facebook, and I'm not really following them, but um, apparently I am. Um, there it is. All right. Good. We got our we got our video sharing right now, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. A little bit rainy here in uh, Cape May, New Jersey. Uh, we're in this in between spring and winter thing. I know it's officially spring, uh, but I think it stays cold around here into uh, April. Uh, so I'm hoping we have a warm. Uh, Easter and we are looking forward hopefully to see you on Easter and that's coming up in just a few weeks and um, and just want to remind you if you want to give to this ministry you could do so by going to capemayfirstassembly.org uh, and hit the donate button there or you can uh, text to give at 609-400-4075 um, we're in uh, Genesis chapter 25 and if you have your Bibles you could turn there or you could um, get your um, I don't know uh, your your computers your phones up I, I turn in the Bible on my phone a lot so uh, you know uh, get that get everything ready and uh, we're talking tonight about how God chooses the unlikely how God's um, God's choice in us isn't based on who we are, what we've done, or how impressive we are, but out of His grace and out of His mercy. So uh, we start out uh, last week. We talked about how um, how the servant went out and got uh, Rebecca uh, from um, from uh, uh, Isaac's family, from Abraham's family, and uh, we meet Laban, who we're going to meet later, who is a real uh, piece of work. And uh, he wants, he is, of course, really impressed with Abraham's servant because he's all about, I'm going to see if I can turn off my email app here. Um, he is all about the uh, money and, uh, and Abraham's servant has a lot of, you know, comes with a lot of stuff, shows that Abraham is rich. So uh, Laban's really into that. Uh, uh, the family wants Rebecca to stay with them for 10, day, 10 days and um, the, uh, the guy, uh, the, the Eliezer, the um, servant of Abraham says, no, um, we got to get back. So uh, Rebecca's willing to go and they go back. And uh, and uh, Isaac brings Rebecca into his mother's tent uh, because she's going to be the new matriarch of the family. And so it comes into uh, uh, chapter 25. We, we have a, for a few interesting things here in the beginning. And, and the first thing is, uh, starting with verse 1, it says, Abraham, and I apologize tonight, I don't have a PowerPoint, so just kind of follow along, but you are welcome to uh, ask your questions and uh, and ask anything you want, put in the uh, comments, and I am able to see them. And so if you join, just please say hi if you're watching right now. Uh, let us know that you're watching uh, just by putting a little um, a comment in the comment sections. Just say hi or if you have a question. Uh, it says, Abraham had taken another wife whose name was Keturah, and she bore him, and there's, I'm not going to read all these names, but she bore, bore him six uh, sons. And then it goes into the uh, genealogies of some of these sons, and it says, all the sons of Keturah, Abraham, uh, these are all the sons of Keturah. And it says, Abraham gave everything he owned to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts to his sons and concubines, and while they were still alive, he sent them eastward away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. And in verse 7 it says, the length of Abraham's life was 175 years. So uh, a little bit of debate here in uh, among some scholars, um, and it's not really a big deal either way. Uh, there's not some major... Um, theological thing here is that so some this could be that after Sarah died Abraham took on another wife and had six sons with her that would be amazing because Abraham was uh well over 100 years old when Sarah died he was probably around 120 
20, uh, somewhere around there. Uh, which So that's possible. The other possibility is uh, the um, that Abraham took on another wife uh, while Sarah was alive. And uh, that's a possibility as well, uh, because we don't really know. Um, but we do know that this, Abraham uh, kept Isaac as the promised child because that's what God had said to him. And uh, so he sends the other sons away from Isaac. And uh, apparently even to Ishmael, it says that he gave gifts. So we see earlier that Ishmael is just sent away. Uh, but perhaps um, later on, gifts were sent to Ishmael. Uh, some sort of support was sent, uh, perhaps. Um, but we're going to find that uh, Ishmael... Uh, in this uh, chapter, Ishmael becomes uh, a great nation. So we move on, uh, and it's really the end of this chapter I want to spend some time on. Uh, verse 7 says, the length of Abraham's life was 175 years. Uh, so we're seeing in the Old Testament that the, the number that people are living is going down. Um, uh, Moses later on will say in a psalm that, Men live 70 years, 80 if they're lucky. And so what's interesting about that is Moses lived to 120. Uh, so um, Moses outlived, uh, apparently, most of the people of his time, according to him. Um, but we see these ages starting to go down now. We're seeing them coming into a normal sort of lifespan. Uh, but Abraham lives 175 years. Um he says, took his last breath, and he died at a good old age and contented. He was gathered to his people. His son Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave. Uh, and um, this was the field Abraham brought from the Hathites. Abraham was buried there with his wife Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed Isaac, who lived near Beer Lahara. Roy, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta look that up. I got a book that like looks up hard words in the Bible that helps you pronounce them. Uh, but um, so a couple things here: uh, Isaac and Isaac and Ishmael come back together to bury their father. They weren't uh, the two people that got along very well, but they come back together for this. Um, he Abraham's buried uh, next to Sarah, but this is an interesting statement here. Um, it says that. Um, Abraham was gathered to his people. Now, uh, any of you have been in college and you've taken maybe an Old Testament survey class or uh, any sort of secular or liberal-leaning uh, school, uh, or not always liberal-leaning schools, even some conservative, uh, when I say conservative, uh, I'm not talking about the political stuff. I'm not talking about Politically conservative, politically liberal. I'm not talking about that. We kind of we. I, I don't know why it's the same term we use for how people interpret the Bible. Do you interpret the Bible as a conservative scholar, or do you can interpret the Bible as a uh, liberal scholar? So the difference the differences would be like this. Uh, one side would say we take what the Bible says seriously, and uh, when we say um, literal interpretation. We're not saying that everything in the Bible is literal. We're saying that you, when you see language that's allegorical, you take it as allegory, but you let the text just kind of say what it says. Uh, liberal uh, theologians would be more loose with the scripture. Uh, there would be more textual criticism. Uh, the, the, they would uh, question a lot of, um, for instance, they would say, well, this idea developed later because it looks like a Greek idea or it looks like, you know, so, um, so, that, so when you're looking at the more liberal side, if you're going to the average college, you, you probably get the more liberal side of the Bible, which is um, uh, kind of... Um, Kind of the way you would interpret uh, the mythology, the Greek mythology, that's the way they would look at it. Whereas we would say, okay, these, these stories are real, they have meaning, uh, so we, we take it seriously. Um, so, having said all that, um, the more liberal side, or even some conservative side, on the conservative side would say that uh, 
the idea of life after death, the idea of the resurrection didn't develop until later on. In fact, uh, many scholars believe that the, the very idea of life after death didn't develop until the Babylonian captivity, which would have been uh, about 500 years uh, B.C. Uh, so uh, they would say early on in the scripture, in this, in this time, uh, there wasn't a doctrine or a thought of um, resurrection. And, uh, and I think this scripture, like other scriptures, uh, you know, we, we can go back to Genesis chapter 5, and it says, uh, Enoch didn't die because the Lord took him. Uh, we also talked about Sarah's death and how they um, laid her body in a tomb and how they were so careful uh, they didn't just burn it. Uh, so there's the idea of the resurrection there because they were concerned about what to do with the bodies. And here is this phrase. Uh, Abraham uh, was old and contented and he was gathered to his people. And that's a very interesting statement because um, if, if there wasn't a belief in the resurrection, they they would have just said um, he, you know, he died or he was laid to rest next to Sarah. So think about this. It's that saying he was gathered to his people. Well, he that doesn't mean that like he was like laid in a tomb with his family because there was only one person there. That person was Sarah. So uh, who is Abraham's people? Well, he left his home, right? So so it isn't necessarily the people he left. Who are Abraham's people? Abraham's people are the people who put their faith and trust in God. That's Abraham's people. Uh, so when we're laid to rest, we are laid to rest with the people of God. We are laid to rest with our people. So I think this scripture really shows us that there is a um, there is a belief early on, even a thread all throughout scripture of the resurrection, the belief in the resurrection. So I, I believe, you know, you go back to Adam and... Uh, all these people believed in a resurrection. They looked forward to a resurrection. Uh, so, um, uh, now there, like I said, there's some more scholars on the conservative side that that would disagree with me on that. And that's okay. Uh, it's not the uh, um, it's not the end of the world because just because just because someone uh, would believe in the resurrection later. And maybe that scripture, that thought, or that that um, uh, theology hadn't been developed yet. That's okay because we see a lot of theology in the Bible just kind of developing as it goes along. Uh, so, um, for instance, when we talk about the seed coming, uh, they didn't know uh, when the seed uh, was going to come. So now I got to, you know what? That's weird because I don't have my app on for messages, but they're still coming through. So we'll just have to deal with it. I don't know if you can hear that. See that big beep, you know? <laughs> Coming through, and it wasn't even an important text. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, don't text me. Uh, make a uh, put put a put a comment on. If you're watching this on Facebook, uh, some of you will be watching it on YouTube, and uh, some of you will be watching it um, on our our website. Uh, but feel free to leave a comment there as well. Um, so, I believe early on there was this belief in the resurrection. And, and I think that's really key because uh, these people lived their lives, put their faith in God, and they looked forward to a day that was coming when they uh, would be raised from the dead. And, and it says when they were uh, gathered with their people, I think it, it gives us an idea that, that uh, the spirit does leave the body and go to a better place. We don't go into a soul sleep, but we go into the place where God is. We, we, we are with him. This is a great hope for us because death is not the end. And to see it this early in scripture shows us that this wasn't some wild idea that just came up later on. This was part of the earliest followers. Um, then we go down to Ishmael's family records here. And um, I'm not going to read all this, uh, but, it, but it shows us something because we see that Ishmael uh, is the father of 12 uh, tribes or 12 uh, groups of people. Uh, the, this scripture says uh, uh, 12 nations, uh, God, uh, you could say leaders, settlements, encampments, um, uh, but God, God said 12 leaders are going to come out of Ishmael. And so we see the fulfillment of this. Uh, we see, um, you know, we talked about Abraham being the father of nations. Well, uh, 
we know that is ultimately through Christ. But we also see here, which is really, really interesting, is we see this fulfillment even in Abraham's life. Because uh, Abraham has Isaac, he has Ishmael, and he has these other six sons, and all of them are fathers of nations. And so um, we see the fulfillment of God's promise. We see the film, fulfillment of God's promise to Hagar, Ishmael's mother, who said that 12 nations would come out of Ishmael. And then we see this in the genealogy. We see the fulfillment of God's promise. So when you're seeing uh, genealogies in the Bible, you're usually seeing uh, either the fulfillment of God's promise or you're seeing them looking for the seed that's going to come, the promise that's going to come. And that's why the genealogies are important. Um, when you're reading the Bible, you, you know, I'm not saying you have to read over each name, but when you're wondering why are they there, it's because the writer is trying to show you how God is working his promises through generation to generation, and his promises are coming true. And that's the point of all the genealogies and everything. Um, so now we get down to verse 19. It says, These are the record, uh, the records of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Abraham father, fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took his wife, Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Armenian, from uh, Paddan Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Armenian. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. Child, ha, childless. The Lord was receptive to his prayer, and his wife, Rebecca, conceived. So um, here we have the, uh, the same story happening again. Uh, this is really amazing. Um, Abraham, uh, uh, you know, waited years and years and years for Isaac to come. And now we see the same thing again. Uh, when we say that Isaac and Rebecca couldn't get married, we're not, couldn't get married, I'm sorry, couldn't get, have a baby. We're not talking five years. We're not talking even 10 years. We're talking 20 years. They were married. Isaac did not have children until he was 60 years old. Um, Isaac was um, 40 years old when he married Rebecca. So you really got this theme of waiting in the Old Testament. You're waiting on God. You're waiting on uh, God to move, and, and there's this testing. And it's almost as if God is um, just waiting to things are impossible. And this theme is going over and over again. So after 20 years of not being able to have children, Isaac sought God. And God answered his prayer, and Rebecca um, was able to have children. And uh, and so, um, let's just talk about this theme in the Bible for a minute. Uh, this is really really fascinating because we see this. We're going to see this uh, several more times in Scripture, where a woman has to pray to have children, and usually she's older before she could have children. So this is a theme over and over again. And so um, uh, they have to pray, the husband prays for the wife, or the woman prays over herself, she's able to have children. Now, that's not to say that sometimes it isn't the man's fault, and the Bible's saying it's always the woman's fault. That's not what's going on. What's going on is, uh, is, is God is using this theme to show uh, barrenness, right? So when, when the couple thinks that it's impossible to have children, that's never going to happen, God comes through. Now, let's take this into the New Testament because this is so cool if you think about this. Um, when do we see this again in the New Testament? Well, we see Zachariah and Elizabeth. And what happens? They're old. They're way past the time of having children. And they get this promise that they're going to have children. In fact, uh, Zachariah was like, how's that going to happen? And God's and the angel's like, you're not going to be able to speak again until you have this ch you know, child. And and uh, it's almost as if the angels say, not only am I here, he says, I'm here. I stand in the presence of God. I just told you this. You don't believe it. But Zachariah has um, thousands of years of this happening in the Old Testament. So, um, so uh, Zachariah, Rye and Elizabeth are the last Old Testament couple. So listen to this. Zechariah and Elizabeth have the Old Testament experience where um, 
you have a baby you're, when you're old and you can't have the baby. They have the Old Testament experience. Then with Mary, God does something new. It's as if God's saying, look, you know I can take old people and give them babies, but now I'm going to do something new. Now a young virgin, a woman who's never been with a, a man at all, is going to have a baby, is going to have a child. Um, when Mary and Elizabeth meet, John the Baptist, John the baby in the womb, jumps in the womb, and, and, and it's almost as if to say, well, it really is to say, the Old Testament is jumping for joy for the fulfillment of the prophecy. See, the Old Testament is really about waiting on God, the whole Old Testament. When's the promise going to come? Well, when John the Baptist meets Jesus, they're both in the womb, John the Baptist, the baby jumps because uh, the, the waiting time is over, and now the fulfillment has come. And so the whole Old Testament is about waiting for the fulfillment, waiting for the Christ, waiting for the child to come, the child that would bring change to the world, waiting for Christ to come himself. Uh, so I, I think that's kind of cool when we see this. So Isaac and Rebecca, that 20 years that they were waiting, that's almost the same amount of time Abraham and his mother Sarah were waiting for Isaac to be born. Uh, so it isn't just like, oh, they had a little problem and then they prayed about it and then they had children. No, they, they were praying about this and worried about this for 20 years. And probably about the time that they were giving up, they had children. Uh, but it doesn't say that that Isaac gave up because he must have known the story of his father. He must have known that God was able to do this. Um, and so now we're going to get the introduction of uh, Jacob and Esau. And it says, but the children inside her struggled with each other and said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will come from you and will be separated. I got this thing in the way here. Okay. And will be separated. One people will be uh, stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. And when the time came to, gave birth, to give birth, uh, there were indeed twins in her womb. The first came out red looking, covered with hair, like a fur coat, and they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out grasping Esau's heel with his hand, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. Um, <laughs> so... So what's happening right away in Sarah's womb there, that um, the babies are prophesying to her. Uh, they're telling her what's going to happen. And so uh, Rebecca isn't just like having a sim uh, symptoms like, oh, the babies are moving around. They were really fighting in the womb. They were really struggling with each other. And when the babies are born, Esau's coming out first, but Jacob's grasping his heel. It's a, he's as if even as a baby, he's trying to supplant Esau. And we're going to see that as they uh, grow, uh, Jacob and Esau will be at odds with each other. And, um, and, and God says here that there are two nations. One will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Um, and this is one of the great mysteries of God. Here's the thing. Here's the thing that's going to bother you, uh, that bothers me. Uh, that bothers all of us. This, this doesn't say that God looked at Jacob and said, uh, Jacob has something inside of him that's special. Jacob is obviously the one that is more righteous. In fact, when, you, when we look at Jacob and Esau, what we're going to find is uh, there are times when Esau looks more righteous than Jacob. Uh, neither of them are winners, really, but um, uh, Esau is just living his life, but Jacob's supplanting him all the time. Uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob's name means heel. Uh, it also could be a phrase for grasping to heal, but it also could be a phrase that means deceiver. And uh, Jacob was a deceiver his whole life. And we're going to see uh, that God chose Jacob not because of any good that was in him, but God chose Jacob because in his wisdom, he chose Jacob. And um, God is going to bring grace to Jacob's life. Um, and 
on one hand, that can make you mad, but on the other hand, it should bring us comfort because God chose you, God chose me, not because of anything great. There's nothing about us that God is going to say, hey, um, you know, uh, there's something so special about you that I want to choose you. I want to choose you to be my child. Now, God chose us. Now, I know we responded to God. Uh, but, um, and, and so I, I guess I'll bring this up. This isn't real. But, um, you know, Romans chapter 9 talks about how um, God uh, chose Jacob out of Esau, out of his wisdom. And so uh, the extreme Calvinistic point of view says that God chooses those who will go to heaven and chooses those who will go to hell. That's called double predestination. We don't believe that. Um, on the other hand, I have to admit this. I don't believe I could have ever come to God if he hadn't reached out to me first. I don't believe there was something special in me that responded to God without the move of the Holy Spirit in my life. And so when you ask the question of, well, does God choose us or do we choose him? Uh, where I come down on this issue is this. God is the one that makes the first move. And so, and, and I believe that's true for every single person. So God made the first move with me. And, and thank God for whatever reason I responded to him and my life was changed. Um, and, and so why did God make that first move toward me? Was it because I was special? No. Was it because I was righteous, more righteous than other people? No. Uh, the scripture says God chooses the foolish things in the world to shame the wise, right? And the weak things to shame the strong. And, and this is what we're seeing here, right? So um, you, we see this theme over and over again in the Old Testament that the younger son is chosen over the older son. And this goes against everything in their society. Uh, the firstborn in society got a double portion of the food every day. So when you sat around the table and all the kids are there, the firstborn son gets a double portion of the food. The firstborn son takes over the inheritance of the family. He has the birthright. And so his birthright allows him to take over the inheritance when the father dies, and he, and he carries on the legacy. Well, God subverted expectations over and over again by saying, no, the younger is going to serve the older. The younger is going to be greater. And, and we're going to see this all through Genesis uh, we're going to see it with Joseph's sons. We're going to see how God, uh, even in his, in his wisdom, he chooses those who are not the greatest. And I think that's just a great theme. So how do we get chosen by God? By not being the greatest, by not being the best, by humbling ourselves, by coming to him and being honest with who we are and what he has done uh, and, and who he is and what he has done in our lives. So, um, so we're going to see as we get into the story of Jacob and Esau, we're going to see some deception. We're going to see some fighting. We're going to see some sibling rivalry. We're going to see some really interesting stuff. But let me uh, leave you with this thought today. You may feel like um, you're not uh, you're not that talented. You're not that special. You may feel like. Uh, that uh, God uh, chooses the most talented, the best looking. Well, look at me. I'm, I'm not any of those things. And, and I would say to you today that God doesn't choose us. Even if we are those things, God isn't impressed with that. God chooses us out of his love and his mercy. And so even though I responded to him and you responded to him, I can't say, well, it's because of my great response to God that God chose me. No, God chose me because he loved me. God chose me because he's called out to me. And thankfully, um, for whatever reason, I responded to him. And forever, for whatever reason, he responded to you. And so God calls all people to himself. Christ died for all people. And, uh, and so we come to him, not by being the wisest, the greatest, the best, but by humbling ourselves and being, uh, and, 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 um, just being who we are with all of our flaws. Uh, here's, here's what I find. I, I've come to a place in my life where I've gotten to interact with some really educated people. And I've gotten a place in my life where I've gotten to interact with some really wealthy people. And sometimes some really important people. And uh, I can tell you this. They got the same problems. 
they got the exact same problems as you and I do. And, and so God doesn't choose them because of they're important or great or anything else. Uh, God chooses them because he loves them. God chose you. God chose me because he loves us. Um, and so uh, there isn't um, there isn't anything about education that makes a person less in, less insecure. There isn't anything about wealth that makes a person uh, feel uh, better about themselves. In the end, we all need Jesus. We all need Christ. Hey, Shirley. Uh, it's great to see you. Let me uh, just put you up here. And, uh, and uh, okay, I don't know what that is. Uh, so uh, thanks for uh, joining us today, and I hope you're doing well. Uh, so let me uh, leave you in prayer. Next week we'll get into the end of 25. We're going to talk about the birthright story, and it's going to be really, really cool. Father, we just come before you today, and we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace to us. We don't deserve to be chosen by you. We don't deserve to have your grace and mercy in our, in our lives, but you have chosen us, and you have called us to yourself. And so, Lord, we pray you awaken our hearts to you today. And, and Lord, we want to know you because you've loved us so much. And Father, we just give you thanks and praise today. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we look forward to seeing you Sunday morning at 945 here on Facebook Live, 1030 in person, and uh, also next week, next Wednesday here at 7 o'clock. God bless you guys tonight, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, later on Sunday. See you later.